Good morning. My name is Mia Bloom, and today I want to talk to you about terrorism. For the last 20 years, I've been obsessed with terrorism. What causes terrorism? What kind of tactics do terrorist groups use? And who becomes a terrorist and why? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes for a second and imagine a terrorist. I'll wager that the majority of you pictured a man between the ages of 18 and 40, perhaps from the Middle East, maybe with a beard. This photo behind me is a member of one of the deadliest organizations in the world, the FARC in Colombia, and yet you see this image challenges many of our assumptions about who becomes a terrorist. Now, to be fair, women have always been involved. If we go back to the 19th century, the very first person ever to be tried for terrorism was a woman named Vera Zulich. She was an anarchist for the people's will, and in 1877, she went on trial in St. Petersburg for trying to assassinate the governor. At her trial, she stood up and said, I'm not a murderer, I'm a terrorist. In the 1960s and 1970s, many of the European terrorist organizations had notorious women members. In Germany, the Bader Meinhof gang was named in part after Ulrike Meinhof, their ideological leader. Her colleague Astrid Prohl robbed banks and would drive the getaway car. And Leila Khaled was a poster child for Palestinian militancy. She inspired a whole generation of Palestinians and was involved in a series of hijackings between 1969 and 1970 for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. She was such an iconic figure that books and movies and poems and songs were written about her in over a dozen languages. And those of you in the room may not be very familiar with Marad Farrell unless you've ever been to Northern Ireland. Farrell was a member of the Provisional IRA she led the women on a hunger strike along with Bobby Sands in 1981. And in 1988, she was gunned down in the street of Gibraltar by special forces as she was plotting to blow up British soldiers. So while it's true that women have been involved, we have to ask ourselves, what's changed? Well, the nature of women's involvement has changed over time. For the most part, women have gone from playing invisible and behind-the-scenes roles to very visible frontline and operational roles. This picture here was taken just moments before Rajiv Gandhi was killed. In it, we see his assassin in orange and green. She attended a rally when he was planning to get re-elected, holding a garland, and she waited for him. When he bent down to accept the garland of flowers, she detonated 700 grams of explosive strapped around her waist. Now this was important because it wasn't just a serious assassination of a major political figure by the Tamil Tigers, but also the assassin was a woman. And in Northern Ireland, this image of an Irish sniper shooting at British soldiers demonstrates that Irish women went from banging garbage can lids to warn the men that the British were coming, maintaining safe houses and ferrying messages back and forth between their family members in jail and the organization to actually picking up the gun and shooting. Another place where we're seeing an increased role for women is on the internet. This woman from Pennsburg, Pennsylvania, just down the road, doesn't look like your average Al-Qaeda operative. Yet, Colleen LaRose, known as Jihad Jane, and her friend, Jamie Ramirez, also known as Jihad Jamie, plotted to kill a Swedish cartoonist because he had depicted the Prophet Muhammad with the body of a dog. They pled guilty to terrorism charges just last week. But perhaps the most infamous of the female jihadis on the internet is Malika el Arud. In Belgium, she ran a website called Midbar SOS, which sent dozens of men to their deaths on the jihad in Iraq and Afghanistan. On the website, she challenged men. She said, unless you go on jihad, you're not a real man. She also encouraged women to join. 
So clearly women's activities in terrorism have been diverse. But the role in which has had the most impact thus far has been the last seven years where we've seen the rise of women suicide bombers. Now suicide bombing is an extremely effective tactic for terrorist organizations. Instead of planting a bomb and walking away, the suicide bomber is able to deliver the explosive directly to the target or to the person. And I'll give you an example why this is important. In 2004, an Al-Qaeda-linked group planned to blow up the trains in Madrid. They planned to blow them up just as they were approaching the, the, the platform of the station so that they would kill not only the people on the train, but also the people on the platform waiting. What ended up happening was that morning, the train was a few minutes late. So instead of blowing up as the train approached the station, the train blew up 800 meters before it arrived. Now had Al-Qaeda used a suicide bomber, they could have just waited a few minutes and they would have killed hundreds if not thousands more. Now while women have not comprised more than perhaps 30% of the total number of suicide bombers, we are certainly seeing an increase of women bombers in places like Iraq and Somalia and Pakistan. You have to wonder, what are some of the motivations that groups have to use women? Well, women are able to do things that male suicide bombers are not. Women are able to avoid detection. And so, during the course of a campaign, when it becomes very difficult for men to pass through checkpoints undetected, if you use a woman, you're more likely to succeed. Because we're not expecting to see women terrorists. They basically use our gender stereotypes against us. Women are also able to get better access. So for instance, they can access certain targets men cannot, or they can penetrate the target more deeply. They can get to the back of the room. When that happens, a small amount of explosive feels like a massive amount of explosive. So a small bit goes a long way. During the course of my research, I've spent time with terrorist leaders, and they've said to me that they felt that the women were more expendable. In their societies, a woman's life was worth less than a man's. But ultimately, the terrorist groups are aware of the PR benefit associated with using female bombers. During the course of my research, I discovered that if it was a female bomber instead of a male bomber, they were likely going to get eight times more press and more articles about the attack. And since terrorist organizations require the media and publicity, they were literally getting more bang for their buck. And finally, when terrorist organizations have a hard time recruiting men, using a woman shames men into participating. It goads men into action. The women make this explicit in their last will and testament martyrdom videos, and they say, I am going to fight because the men are weak. When I interviewed members of the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE in Sri Lanka, they confirmed my suspicions about why they used women. And they added one additional piece of information, which I thought was fascinating. All things being equal, they would choose the more attractive women, knowing that they were going to get all this press and media attention, but also because they knew it would be more shocking for a beautiful woman to be a bomber. This is not just true in Sri Lanka. If you were to look at some of the female bombers in the Middle East, someone like Sana Mahadali, a 17-year-old Christian girl in Lebanon who blew up in 1985 to oppose the Israeli occupation, and another Christian girl in Lebanon, Norma Abi Hassan, who was 26, this shows us that suicide bombing transcends any one religious tradition. But also, if you look at the rest of the women, Wafa Idris, the very first Palestinian suicide bomber, who was a, an ambulance driver for the Red Crescent Society. Hanadi Jaradat, the first Islamic Palestinian bomber for the Islamic Jihad, who sat down in a seaside cafe in Haifa and exploded after her lunch. And Ahlam al-Tamimi, 
who was a chief plotter for Hamas, who helped orchestrate and plan one of Israel's deadliest attacks, the attack that Hamas perpetrated at the Sabara Pizzeria. These all were bombshells in their community. The prettiest women, the most attractive, the most successful. I deliberately chose this image for the cover of my book because I wanted to challenge certain assumptions that we have about who becomes a terrorist, but also because for Al-Qaeda, the ideal operative will look like the girl next door. She'll be blonde, she'll be beautiful, and she'll be Western. The other thing that women are able to do that men cannot is disguise the bomb in a very unique way. What we've seen time and time again is that the women pretend to be pregnant. In this image, Anoja Kugentharasa feigned pregnancy for several weeks by visiting the maternity clinic at a military installation. Her goal, to kill the general in charge of the Sri Lankan military. After several weeks where she established the alibi of being pregnant, she waited at the front gates. As the general's car approached, she blew up. She killed herself and several of his aides, but the general survived. The improvised explosive device is worn around the midsection to give the appearance of late-term pregnancy, especially when worn under traditional clothes. We need to ask ourselves, why do women do this? I've summarized women's motivations as the five R's. Redemption. Many of the women that I've introduced you to had something in their past that they hoped to wipe the slate clean and reinvent themselves. So no one would remember that the woman had a child out of wedlock. No one will remember that this woman cheated on her husband. Nobody would remember anything about a woman except that she was a martyr. Revenge is most often cited as the reason why women become suicide bombers. And this is certainly true in places like Chechnya, where the women have lost husbands, brothers, sons, and fathers during two Chechen wars. The women think that becoming a suicide bomber and getting involved in terrorism, they will get the respect of their community. And in fact, the best predictor of a woman's involvement in terrorism is relationship to a male member of a terrorist organization. This is not just because terrorism becomes the family business in places like Ireland and Chechnya, but also it's an excellent vetting opportunity for the terrorist organizations to ensure that this person's not an informer. It also means that the women are less likely to change their mind at the last minute because they don't want to disappoint their family. And increasingly in the last few years, we've seen rape be one of the ways in which women are mobilized into terrorism. Now, historically, this was at checkpoints or during midnight search and seizure operations by military members of the other side. But in the last few years, we've even seen members of the terrorist organization rape the women themselves. This is because a woman who is raped is considered damaged goods in those societies. They will not be marriageable. And so what the terrorist organizations do is they embrace the women and say, no, that's fine. You have, you're going to die anyways as a result of the honor code because you've brought shame on your family. Take a few of the enemy with you. The women are basically told that they can do more in their death than they can ever do with their lives. This is reinforced by cultures of martyrdom that are created in their communities that extol women terrorists by painting them on the sides of buildings, whether it's murals in Northern Ireland or graffiti in Palestine. In Sri Lanka, there will be small little museums set up to commemorate the female tigers. And the first Palestinian bomber, Wafa Idris, that I introduced you to before, has inspired a series of novels and there was been, there's been a training camp for little girls named after her to follow in her footsteps. As we've recently commemorated the 10th anniversary of 9-11, we need to think about what have we learned about terrorism and what do we think will happen in the future. I don't need to tell you who this man is. I think he's familiar to everyone. But I think that this is the face of terrorism in the past. 
In Iraq, the woman who organized the rape of 80 girls to turn them into suicide bombers for Ansar al Sunna, an Al Qaeda in Iraq affiliate, is Samira Ahmed Jassim. This is the current face of terrorism. And what is perhaps extremely disturbing is the future face of terrorism is a younger face. Increasingly, terrorist organizations are, are coercing and forcing children to become suicide bombers. It is the ultimate form of child exploitation. We're seeing this in places like Iraq, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, where schools are being set up to do nothing more than teach the children to become suicide bombers at the young age of eight or nine or 10. We were caught off guard by female suicide bombers. What I would say is that we should be aware what terrorist organizations are capable of doing and perhaps what we can expect next. Thank you so much for your time.